Now, what are the key things you should be watching on Brexit in 2018? Joining me now is Labour's Mary Honeybull and Dan Dalton from the Conservatives to talk through their predictions for this year ahead. Now, Dan, let's start with you. The first thing in terms of Brexit we're going to be focusing on is this transition period and getting this agreement about what that two-year, roughly, period is going to look like. For you, is that going to be something that's going to be relatively easy uh, for the government and for the EU to come to an agreement on? Well, I think it's going to be a little bit more complex than people maybe realise because, for example, agriculture and fisheries, there's no history of a, a non-EU country being in the common agricultural policy or common fisheries policy. So that's got to be addressed, particularly in terms of payments to what would be a non-EU country at that stage. Also, uh, the issue of the customs union, because uh, countries that are in the customs union but are not in the EU uh, lose access to the third countries that the EU has trade deals with. Uh, so that, I think that's also got to be sorted out um, going through this transitional period. But just to confirm, the government policy in terms of the transition deal is that basically nothing is going to change. There'll be The government and the UK will be going along with all the rules and regulations, including newly adopted ones, yeah. during that two-year window. And it's basically just a status quo buffer period. So in terms of actually agreeing that point is there not is there anything really to discuss there just what? actually you know in terms of those, that just that two year window but that's the, that's our position that's the uk government position the difficulty is the eu doesn't necessarily have the same position on some of these things as i mentioned on agriculture and fisheries there's no history of a country outside of the eu being in these policies even for a short period of time and the customs union is actually a bigger problem it's a wto issue can a country that's not in the EU benefit from the EU um, trade deals? Uh, and this is a longer term problem with the customs union going forward. Uh, none of these have been addressed. They'll be addressed probably over the first six months uh, of this year. And I think it will take probably six months to get these issues ironed out. And so when do you think this, in terms of clarity on the transition or implementation period, as the government likes to call it, when do you think that's actually going to be met, in your, in your opinion, the, all, of the, all of the creases smoothed out? I think it will take at least half of this year, I think. Half of this year? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's complex, a transition. It's, it's not as simple, maybe, as, 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 as people sometimes think. Mary, half a year? Well, I, I think Dan's being very optimistic about that. One of the main problems, of course, is that the government really still doesn't have any idea what it wants at the end of this process. So the, we're still faced with a government that really hasn't decided what it actually wants to do in reality and in actual Are you talking fact, there in terms of the transition deal or just no, the general? In, in general and of course it matters because if you have a transition deal you presumably have to have a, some idea what you want at the end of it and also we mustn't forget that we've only really got 10 months because whatever is agreed um, by but in, in whatever is agreed will have to be agreed itself by all the member states, which means something being done by round about October so that it can go through all the member state governments. So we're talking about a very short time indeed. And judging by what's happened so far, that just simply is not going to be long enough. I mean, let's just focus on this, this beyond the transition then and this 10 month window. In terms of the issues that we should be, or do you both think are going to be the, the pivotal or sticking points? Um, Mary, let's start with you. What, what do you think are going to be the real problems which really are going to take the real effort to, to get beyond? It's very difficult to see what isn't going to be a problem. Um, we really haven't got anywhere very much at the moment. We got through to this second phase. Well, we got phase. sufficient progress, we're, which we some were doubting we'd be able to get. We quite a lot of fudging on important issues, mainly the Irish border, which is really very difficult, and there's Gibraltar as well. Um, as you know, I represent London, and there's huge issues with the City of London, which have been discussed with Barnier, and seems to be looking as if the city's going to lose a lot of what it's already got, creating huge problems, and financial services are already moving to other EU countries. We really aren't near well, I mean, that, any that's, kind that's of a very acceptable... Well, that's very subjective term. We, haven't, we are not near any acceptable agreement on virtually everything, and we've only got 10 months. I mean, and that's obviously, in terms of the agreements on financial services, that the, the EU's position is up for, for negotiation, what they say about passporting rights, everything like that, that will be decided on in the, in the actual negotiation process. So that's by no means set in stone. Um, well, I don't know. It, it's, you, you say that, and of course it will be part of the negotiations, but quite what will happen is another matter, because obviously the financial services is one of the, the 
Britain's main selling points and one of our major industries. Well, and for Europe and, as and, well. And, it's and it is important for Europe, but it's actually rather more important for us. And we know that a lot of the major city firms have already decided that they're not going to risk it and they're moving part of their operations to EU countries. So this is going to be a huge issue for us. But then equally in reports lesser than was originally reported back in the Brexit sort of project fear days when there was going to be thousands, suddenly there's only hundreds and then there's just a few offices. There's a lot of that going on as well. Though, yeah. Well, there is a lot of that going on and I think there may well have been exaggerations. In fact, there were exaggerations with project fear, but the basis of what it was thing. about is still happening and we are seeing also the economy. The British economy is basically not in good shape either. So there's a lot of things we have to take into account. Well, first of all, I take umbrage to, with the fact that the government that, as Mary suggests, the government doesn't have a plan. The government does have a plan. It's been very clear from the word go that what we want is a free trade deal with the EU based on Canada, but much, much, much more uh, deep than the relationship with Canada. That includes services and financial services as part of a bigger association agreement that will include other things like terrorism, aviation, criminal records, all of these other things, probably access to research Which funding. one of those do you think is actually going to pose a problem? For, I mean, it seems clear for me, but in your opinion, from, from your gauge of being here, out of all those issues, where some of them, like um, Euratom, the nuclear cooperation or cooperation over uh, other, other regulations, it might be kind of straightforward, but are there any issues you think are going to be real sticking points? But all these issues are technical. All these issues have lots of different people that want their say and stuff. But ultimately, none of these issues are insurmountable, particularly because we start from a framework that we're already involved deeply in all of these programs. So none of these things are insurmountable if there's will on both sides. And in terms of financial services, I mean, let's be clear. If financial services is excluded from the European market, that is as a bigger problem for the European market as it is for London. Well, because I, most I of the that, capital... That's absolutely a debatable point. So I certainly wouldn't well, agree with that. And I would also like to point out that the agreement with Canada, the free trade agreement the EU recently signed with Canada, took seven years to negotiate. And Canada is a friendly country which doesn't diverge particularly from the EU. I accept what Dan's saying, that we are here already and there is obviously alignment and all those other things but we are leaving and that does actually mean that it will be seen in a different light and I just think 10 months is an impossibility. But I mean the free trade deal or whatever the, the future relationship come is going to a lot of that's going to be negotiated during the transitional phase as well. That's part of the reason for having the transitional phase so that you can have a bit longer to negotiate these long term agreements what happens post the transitional phase and because I was a little bit interrupted on the, on the financial services just, just to make the point is most of the capital that is raised for European businesses is raised through London. If London is cut off from the European financial sector, that is going to have repercussions for European industry as well as for the UK. So it is in everyone's interest to try and ensure that the breakup that you have in terms of financial services is as small as possible. Now, I'm not saying there isn't going to be barriers to trade, but I do believe that we're going to get uh, a mutually acceptable uh, uh, outcome in the end. And over the last 10 years that I've been in and around the European Parliament, every time the European Union has come forward with some new financial legislation, all I've heard from all the banks is they're going to move to Switzerland to avoid the European legislation. So this idea that just being outside of the European Union from a financial services perspective is going to mean the end of the City of London, I, I just think is completely yeah, untrue. I, I didn't ever say it was going to be the end of the City of London, but I think it is a major issue and I don't think it's going to be as easy as you say it is. And, and I would say I felt throughout this whole process that there's been a lot of wishful thinking going on on the part of the government. We don't have much progress so far. And in addition to which, the country itself, Britain itself, has always been very divided on this. The referendum was 52-48. That's moving a bit in terms of, to, of people wanting to remain. But there's still all those divisions. The government, the cabinet itself, is also divided. This is not a good way to be going into negotiations. OK, let's have a... Two line summary from both of you then, 2018. If we come back in 2019, start of 2019, what do you predict the outlook will be uh, in terms of these Brexit negotiations? Dan? Well, I believe we will have had an agreement on the transition so everyone's ready to know what happens after March 2019. And I think we will have started uh, the free trade and association negotiations that will come past that. Mary? I don't think there will be an agreement. I think we will be moved on a bit, but not an awful lot more. I think there will be a lot more um, agitation from people in Britain about what's going on. And I think we could see some quite significant changes in the future.